So, anxiety, fear, being scared, feeling nervous, feeling uneasy, butterflies in the belly, apprehensive, unsettled, shaky, panicky, obsessive, compulsive, phobic terrified. These are all words, these are all shades of the broad experience of anxiety, which is certainly a normal experience. And for many, it's been intensified by this time of plague over the last year, included with significant uh, political conflicts in my home country of America, and certainly other countries around the world, have experienced significant internal conflicts as well during this time. So it's understandable if there's anxiety, including garden variety anxiety, like trying to remember whether you locked the front door on your way out, or you're wondering why your lipid levels in your cholesterol are still high after you've had this very holistic diet, or you're, you're worried about a friend of yours who maybe has, has lost a loved, one re a loved one recently, and you know your friend still, still seems really pretty upset about it. And you're starting to, to worry, to worry about her. Different kinds of anxiety. Um, feeling um, worried about whether you said the wrong thing in a conversation with someone recently. and Did that other person take offense? Uh, worried that you won't find love. Uh, in the second half of your life, uh, worried that you'll never really turn the corner on a business problem you're, you're grappling with. These are different concerns of various kinds. And I want to talk tonight about five different ways to practice with anxiety, to practice with fear. And as a bit of a context for this, I think it's uh, quite arguable that the very first emotion that began to evolve, or the neurological capabilities for which began to evolve in our ancestors, beginning maybe 600 million years ago even, when the nervous system first began to emerge, certainly by 500 million years ago, when complex creatures with nervous systems were living in the primordial seas. And arguably the very first emotion of all is fear. Fear and its cousin, disgust which are both emotional reactions to threat, including potentially mortal threat. <clears throat> fear is deep. Fear is fundamental. Our sense of fear uh, is grounded in that imperative in nature, live to see the sunrise and pass on genes that pass on genes. So fear is really, really natural. And it can be challenging to disengage from fear, uh, we can become afraid of not being afraid, because if we're not afraid, then we might lower our guard and wacko, that's when we get smacked. So it could be hard to release fear, even if it creates a lot of suffering for you and contraction and conflicts maybe with other people, or maybe if the price you pay for your fear is you swerve away from opportunity, you live smaller than you need to, you live inside the bars of an invisible cage when you don't have to today, even if you maybe needed to in years past. So there's a price we pay. It's a price we pay for needless fear. And yet it seems so hardwired into our very being. So it's, it's important. It's important territory. And when we feel afraid ourselves, we tend to act in ways that give others cause for fear. We feel threatened, and then we become threatening. We feel afraid, we contract, we disengage from relationships, and then others uh, are afraid that they won't be loved by us any longer. These are real issues with fear. So it's a very important topic. I'm glad you're all here. And uh, if you want, you'll be able to look at the recording if you, if you want to review this material. So I want to talk about five ways to practice with fear, in particular, five ways to, to release fear over time. Here we go. The first may seem counterintuitive, it's paradoxical, it's to accept anxiety. 
is to start by feeling the feelings, as I said in the meditation, and accepting them. If we don't accept our fear, then we can maybe move into anger to cover over the fear, which could be problematic in relationships. If we don't accept the fear in its primacy in terms of sensations and emotion, then we can spin out into rumination, loops of thought over and over again, getting very elaborate, um, whose function really is to move us away from the raw, direct, accepting experience of fear. And you might explore this right now with something that you're worried about, it, to burrow into, okay, I know my thoughts about this thing. What am I actually feeling? What are the body sensations in this experience of, of worry or nervousness or alarm that I'm having? What are the body sensations? Can I accept those body sensations? They're there. They are what they are. Oh, but they're bad. Oh, but they should be different. Oh, but they're good. Ugh. Let that go. Stay with the raw feeling, the pure body sensation and emotion as best you can. It's useful to resource yourself to be able to do that in various practices for myself and others, like being able to kind of find a, a stance inside yourself of relative calm and, and okayness as you, from which then you witness the fear with quiet eyes. Uh, as um, I forget his name, African American minister, no longer alive from Los Angeles, um, Howard Thurman, I think, Howard Thurman. Um, I think. You look at your own fear, you bow to it, you accept it. It's here. I see you. I accept you. It's really powerful to do that. And you probably will find that a lot of the agitation and a lot of the secondary reactions to the fear disperse and diminish as you drop into accepting. Oh. I'm afraid. Oh, there is anxiety. It is there. I don't need to make it mean something necessarily. I don't need to react to it. It doesn't need to invade the core of my being. I can accept. Oh, oh, you too. Oh, hello again, my familiar friend. Hello, anxiety. That's the first suggestion. And there's actually really interesting research that shows that when people kind of open into and allow and accept so-called negative emotions of different kinds, including the whole spectrum of anxiety, it creates a release. It creates a kind of freedom uh, in relationship to that experience. So that's first. Second, as I said in the meditation, recognize what's all right right now. Okay, there's this thing that's scary. And okay, there's reactions in the body getting kind of revved up about it, maybe. Okay, and also what's true? Is breathing still going on? Is the heart still beating? Are the walls still standing? Are you still alive? Are you still able to think? Are you still functioning? And if you're not, you're not, but most of the time you are. Are others around you still here? Do you still have options? Are the lights still on? You know, does this, do the stoplight still work? What's also all right, right now? It's very important to turn to that because due to the brain's negativity bias, especially a primal emotion like fear, we tend to zero in on it and form a kind of tunnel vision as we over-focus on the alarm bell that's ringing, the light that's flashing, uh, the paranoid thought we have about something or other. We zero in on that and we lose sight of the total surround. So it's important to push the, I guess the F-stop in the camera going real old school here, that widen the aperture, widen the view to take in all that is still going okay. Maybe it's not going okay in your own life, but over there, children are laughing. Over there, people are still talking with each other. You know, the world is still going on, you know, and let that sense then of basic all rightness, the reassuring sense of, okay, I'm still functioning, I'm still okay, basically. Open into a growing sense, as we did in the meditation, of calming and centering. 
It's like finding our ground, you know, a place where we can stand. I was reflecting earlier on the, I believe, Maori term. I'm sure I don't understand all the cultural connotations of it, but the, the I don't recall the word from the Maori people in New Zealand, but the term is a place to stand, you know, finding a place where I am standing. I am standing here, calming, centering, basically all right. Really important. So we're starting to see a growing disengagement from anxiety, and we're stepping out of the anxiety hijack increasingly. Third practice, and these kind of can mush together. These can also happen pretty quickly. These can also, you can take your time with them systematically. If there's something that you're worried about, I do recommend that you take a few minutes, maybe 10 or 20 minutes in a systematic way, or maybe in your next meditation, you move through specifically these five different ways of practicing with, with this thing you're afraid of. Okay, now to the third. I also engaged it in the meditation is to bring heart to it. Get in touch with your heart. Could be the physical area around your heart in your chest. Could be a sense of, um, you know, compassion for yourself. Ugh, this sucks. Ugh, this is hard. Ugh, this is scary. Ah, I really hope certain things, uh, such and such doesn't happen. Yes, her scary, suffering compassion for yourself. There can also be heart for others, which can also tend to pull us out of the contraction around fear and widen us and open us for others for their sake, including morally, and also for our sake as we widen that awareness through um, goodwill. To the extent that it's real for you, good wishes for them. You know, wishing them well, even as you're grappling with something that's scary for you. Find heart. You know, come into the heart. Uh, also, of course, recognize others who are supportive, to the extent that's true. Simple sense of support. Maybe bringing up the emotional memory of times in your life when you were part of a group of friends. That That's real. That was real. Even if those friendships are no longer existing today for various reasons, uh, it was real when it was real. And you can get in touch with the emotional memory of that in your body. And, you know, in that way too, come into a sense of heart. You might have a sense of courage in your heart or being wholehearted or taking heart. The root of the words for courage or encouragement are in French, heart, coming into the heart. You know, when you feel rested in the heart, these are different ways of talking about, you find your own way, maybe non-verbally, maybe simply a hand on your heart when you're scared about something. You know, uh, you might adapt perhaps a meditative teaching from Thich Nhat Hanh, you know, with each breath, you know, I have arrived, I am at home, here in the heart. I have arrived. I am home. Taking heart. Finding the heart. The heart amidst the fear. That can be enormously helpful in part because of our evolutionary history and small hunter-gatherer bands primarily uh, dealing with real threats, predators, other aggressive bands, natural hazards, illness, you know, the difficulties of life. Um, in that context, the sense of being connected with others was enormously important, and it was therefore enormously reassuring. We evolved the sense of reassurance, uh, and, you know, when we're with positive uh, bonds of connection, that can really help us with our fears. So, find heart. Okay. Fifth, fourth rather, number four, do something. <laughs> do something. Action binds anxiety. Maybe the action is inside your mind where you say, I don't have a plan, I need to make a plan. Okay, 
that's something to do. Uh, also, when you uh, appraise, when you evaluate the threat and the issue at hand, make sure that you're appraising it accurately and you're not doing what the brain is kind of designed to do, which is to overestimate the threat, especially if it's near and close at hand. And um, you know, make sure you're, you're seeing it accurately and then take effective action. There are a lot of people who are, are kind of trapped in helpless anxiety. Helpless anxiety is the worst. Anxiety is bad enough. Helpless anxiety really is not good for you. And it's just a veil of tears, right? So as soon as you can, you know, accepting how you feel, so you're not adding resistance to it or beating yourself up about it or ruminating about it. You're just dealing with the primacy of what you feel. If you're also kind of grounding in what's basically okay, you're starting to find your footing again in what's basically okay, calming and centering. And then you're also, you know, bringing heart to bear, getting in touch with your heart. Then on the basis of all that, you're kind of mobilized here. Do something. Take action. Whatever it might be. Reaching out to others as resources. Um, getting a second opinion for a medical issue deciding whether to speak to an attorney, uh, doing little things every day that might take you to a better place. Where you do have opportunities for action, take the actions you can. Recognize the limits of your influence. There are things you can't do anything about. You may have an intractable terminal illness that has only one end to it. You, there might have been a loss that puts you in significant financial difficulty. You can't reverse the loss. So I'm not saying magical thinking here, and I'm not trying to speak from a place of privilege here. I, I'm really trying to acknowledge there are certain conditions that are scary and difficult that we cannot do anything about. Get it, get it. And meanwhile, ring the bells that still can ring while forgetting your perfect offering, to paraphrase Leonard Cohen. Meanwhile, as Nikosi Johnson, the South African boy born with HIV who acquired AIDS, uh, died probably around age 12, became a national hero, to paraphrase closely a thing he said, do what you can in the place where you are with what you've been given in the time that you have. This is the fourth suggestion or practice. Take action. Do something. Make a list. Work your list. Revise your list. <laughs> you know, talk with other people. Improve your plan. Keep you know, doing what you can. That will really be helpful with regard to the things that you're anxious about. If you're afraid, understandably, of systematic forms of oppression, societally grounded forms of mistreatment or threat, such as terribly uh, being Asian, if that's an okay term to use, or of Asian descent in America with hate crimes and violence and horrible forms of harassment and mistreatment on the rise. You know, understandably, uh, you can you can worry about certain situations. Maybe you're someone who understandably is concerned for your personal safety, walking alone down a dark street in the middle, you know, late at night, coming home, let's say, from work, from a shift at the hospital, uh, understandably. So in that, we do what we can in our personal life, in the moment, whatever we can, Obviously, meanwhile, societally, at the public policy level, we should do what we can, all right? And it may be that there's a limit to what we can actually do. So what can we do meanwhile? Well, we can always take action inside our own mind. We can adopt a stance in relationship to a particular threat. We can practice with our anxieties with regard to that particular threat. We can take on board a lesson 
that says, wow, this is kind of freaky down this dark road late at night. Uh, if I make it to my home, which I hope I do, uh, I'm going to be, you know, I'm not going to walk down the street again or next time I bring a flashlight or work with a friend or do what I can. You know, maybe that's the action to take to learn a kind of lesson, to put in a kind of correction without the collateral damage of beating yourself up about it, whatever it is, some kind of action, you know? And if you get caught in loops inside your mind or you're with other people who say, yeah, but what about? Yeah, but what about? I got it, there's so much we can't predict. There's so much we can't control. Got it. <sighs> and what's left that you truly can do something about and know that you're doing, know that you're an agent. You are a cue ball, not an eight ball with regard to what it is that you're actually doing. If you have a chronic worry about something, uh, if, if you feel apprehensive, if you're uneasy, if you're avoiding doing something that would be good for you, that you know rationally you know, when you're with, or intuitively would be good for you, if you're avoiding it, you're swerving away from it to you know, uh, not risk the dreaded experience of, of uh, some sort of bad event you fear might occur, all right? If that's the case again and again and again, ask yourself, are there things you could do to reduce whatever is the actual threat, also to reduce and eliminate any overestimation of the, of the threat? Are there things you could do? And are there things you could do to build up different kinds of resources outside yourself and inside yourself so that you can afford not to swerve away, not to procrastinate yet one more day, not to avoid picking up that phone or posting your profile on a dating site or putting your, your resume your, uh, out in the world again or um, finally telling someone that you know you don't really you don't like it when they do something. If you are clear that you really ought to do that, but you're avoiding it, you're deferring it yet one more day, here too, you could take action. What would enable you to whew, take the higher road that in your heart you know is right for you? And then take the actions to develop that and then take the action of the higher road. Okay. Fifth and last, and then I'll open it up for discussion, plenty of comments, questions coming in. Um, and I'll speak to them maybe with some person or two who might want to raise their hand. The fifth is the most challenging in some ways, and it's the most fundamental, far-reaching, um, and the ultimate resort, which is to surrender. <sighs> to surrender to frailty, to having a body that um, began, in a sense, to die the moment it was conceived, uh, to realize that our relationships are impermanent, conditions are impermanent, including the conditions of other people, to surrender to the limits of what we can do, uh, to know that we've done everything we can, these first four practices, and then surrender to, as best we can, the ultimate, and find a way to be at peace, even if the worst happens. It doesn't mean we want the worst. We're not acquiescing to it. We're not succumbing to it. We're simply living in a kind of serenity that can live with the worst that can happen. I'll give you a couple examples from my own personal life. Um, and I've talked about this a little earlier today on the podcast. We're going to release about this material too in the Being Well podcast in, in a couple of weeks probably. So you might hear it again if you hear it there. When I was a kid, I was quite anxious, quite fearful, and very active imagination. Uh, when I took a Rorschach test, uh, the person who um, you know, uh, you know, uh, gave, you know, you know, gave me the test on, as I prepped for my licensure exam as a psychologist. You know, and she reviewed it with me. She looked at me a little funny. She knew me quite well as a very kind of grounded grad student raising a young family functional kind of person. She said, are you feeling okay, Rick? <laughs> yeah. She said, wow, you saw a lot of stuff. And I'm the kind of person that you show me an inkblot. I 
I think it's a test. Like I'm supposed to see a lot. I'll see a lot. So I have a lot of imagination. Anyway, there I was, a little kid, freaked out about what was under my bed. Uh, monsters under my bed. I could hear little sounds. I could feel little bumps. And, you know, I was just stuck. Like, oh, no, if I, if I look under the bed, it'll eat my face. It'll jump on me. But I just eventually got so sick and tired of feeling scared there. If I call out to my parents, uh, if I turn on the light, it'll get me, it'll get me. Finally, I just gave up. I just gave up to the worst case scenario. Ha! Huh! And I did one of the bravest things I've ever done, which is to lean my head you know, over the side of the bed. <sighs> and I still can right now feel that memory of like, I don't know, 60 plus years ago, probably. Ah! And uh, there was nothing there, of course, but a bunch of dust balls and whatever. Um, and, and I just, there was a surrender, you know, just, uh, same with airplane flight back when I was taking a lot of airplanes, doing a lot of travel pre COVID, um, you know, the plane's going to take off and just out of control. And I don't want to freak anybody out. Air travel statistically is very, very safe. That said, I would do a little thing where, uh, I would imagine the whole plane is surrounded with white light. I would wish everyone on the plane well, and I would kind of review my life and accept that the plane might crash. It's really good practice to feel grateful for my life, to know the course I'd miss my family and friends and I'd feel sad that they would miss me, of course. But fundamentally, huh, I accept I accept it. I can accept the worst. I don't want it. I don't prefer it. I can accept it and I can surrender to it. This is a deep step. You can't do it unless it's real. You can't fake it. But if you can feel it, you know, like maybe you're scared about a medical diagnosis. You're avoiding, you know, checking that lump or, you know, getting the blood draw. Or you're really scared about what will happen if you tell someone that you really care for them and kind of hope they care for you too. And sure, sometimes it's appropriate to not blurt things out or to wait a while, but underpinning so much of what we're afraid of is an existential kind of fear that is released when we find a way to surrender to whatever the worst may be that can happen while being crystal clear that we're not approving of it, we're not countenancing it, we're not um, respecting it. I think of, I'll finish here, with this uh, beautiful couplet from Dylan, Dylan Thomas, uh, this beautiful poem, uh, these, there were these lines that sit on top of his tombstone, I think in Westminster Abbey in, in London. And um, the lines are, time held me green and dying, though I sang in my chains like the sea. Time held me green and dying while I sang in my chains like the sea. Whew. There's no escape from those chains, right? And meanwhile, we can sing in our chains like the sea or as I like to draw upon that great Dharma teacher, Neil Young, keep on rocking in the free world. <sighs> okay, practicing with anxiety. I'm gonna take a peek um, at uh, the sidebar questions. Uh, feel free to comment you know, there. And uh, then maybe if you want, you could take a look at the reactions button at the bottom of the Zoom window. And uh, if you want to talk with me, if you have a question that we're going to talk about, please make it concise and focused on our topic tonight and of general interest, ideally. And recognize that uh, we want you, uh, your voice and image will not show up in the Zoom recording of this, but, but other people will be able to hear and see you if you, if you talk with me about this. Okay? So I'm going to take a quick peek out there at the sidebar. Um, excellent, excellent, excellent comments coming in. You might see some of the wisdom of other people. Um, great. Okay. So, 
someone texted me directly, and this is a friend of mine, so and you know who you are. So hello, hello, friend. Um, what if the anxiety or fear is unfocused? Very important point. You feel it, but you don't have a particular reason for it. Really, really good. So a couple psycho psychotherapeutic distinctions just to kind of clarify things. There's a distinction between what's called trait anxiety and state anxiety. So states typically are a response to particular things, like a fear about seeing the doctor. Trait anxiety, which can be the accumulated effect of many states of anxiety, including potentially traumatic states of anxiety. So there can be acquired over time, um, sometimes turbocharged by a temperament that innately at birth is constitutionally relatively anxious in a normal way. I was tilted a little that way myself. Um, so you can acquire trade anxiety, and you can also have a certain amount of innate trade anxiety that's like a background trickle, if not stream, of ongoing fear. And um, that's really difficult to deal with. Right? There's a, in the extreme, it can be what's called a generalized anxiety disorder, where you're just living in anxiety chronically. So it's really difficult. One thing to do about it is, of course, to gradually treat it, to take it on. It's like depression. Do what you can to treat it if you're motivated to do so. Treat the generalized anxiety. All kinds of ways to do it, practicing calming, drawing on the methods I've described, minimizing state anxiety so we don't keep reinforcing it, um, you know, making sure the physiology is optimal because sometimes when your physiology, our digestion, our hormones, et cetera, are dysregulated, even in subtle, not extreme, put you in a hospital ways, but significant ways, that can send primal signals of alarm, biological uh, signals of alarm up through the body mind because the body's a little wonky. Body's complicated, 100 trillion cells, complicated, a lot of different systems. As we age, they can get out of whack. Life can knock them out of whack. And then they can make us feel bodily disturbed, which then sh produces a kind of sense of anxiety that then we try to interpret and look for a reason outside ourselves, right? Oh, there must be something threatening around me because I'm feeling this underlying sense of uneasiness. Well, the uneasiness is because your digestive system is trying to tell your immune system that there's something a little wonky in your microflora, in your gut, for example, just one example. And you know, so it's important to not overinterpret that kind of physiologically rooted impersonal anxiety. Important point. So we treat, try to treat the trait anxiety in a, in a serious way. Uh, gradually challenging um, thoughts, you know, attitudes, perspectives that are overly alarmist, um, overly tilted toward preventing the bad, including maybe preventing the bad in the social sphere, always feeling a little insecurely attached to others and anxiously attached. It's called the subtype of insecure attachment here is anxious. Uh, another subtype of insecure attachment is avoidant. Both are rooted in fear of one kind or another related to our relationships. And so um, what you can work with are the cognitions, the thoughts, the beliefs, the frames, the perspectives that uh, overestimate threats and are overly focused on prevention rather than promotion of various opportunities, over-focused on threats, under-focused on opportunities. So you can work with that in general. And then Quite specifically, and I'm finishing on this point, then I'll take a question. I see Mira has her hand up here. Uh, maybe some other people as well. Do I see you? I have to move my screen. Shilpa, I see you too. Great. Um, my friend Shilpa. And uh, so what I was just trying to say is that another way to practice with this is to just appreciate that generalizing anxiety is like a ringing in your ear. It's unpleasant and meaningless. And it's not yours. It's impersonal, it's there, it's unfortunate, bummer, but the key practice is to not overinterpret it, not make it mean things. It's impersonal. It's like a car alarm that won't turn off across the street. It's like that ringing in your ears, it won't go away. And the, the thing to do is basically to ignore it. <laughs> you know, it's there, uh, accept it, it's there, all right. 
it's there and it doesn't mean anything. I mean, we often get in trouble. We make our thoughts or our feelings mean something. And, and the horrible truth and the wonderful liberating truth is a fair fraction of our experiences are meaningless. <laughs> they're there, pleasant, unpleasant, heartfelt, or neutral, they're there, but they're kind of meaningless. They don't mean anything. And uh, relating to them in that way can be wonderfully freeing. Okay, so first Mira and then Shilpa. Mira, so I'm gonna ask you to unmute and turn your camera on so others can hear you and see you. Is that okay? Great. Hi, Mira. Hi. Oh, I recognize you too. Excellent. Good to see you. Yeah. I just wanted to mention that I have found grounding to be very effective Great. in anxiety disorders and also earthing. What did you say? Earthing? Earthing, yeah. What earthing. does that mean? Going into the earth? You mean touching uh, the earth, the ground? No, yeah. feeling your feet on the ground. Yeah. And literally going outside, you know, putting your feet Beautiful. on the ground, right? And really feeling, feeling it. Thank you. That, is, that is the key. So you are changing your focus mm -hmm. from going up because energy, it goes up. When you're anxious, it goes up. So I get to ground it into the earth and also sending roots and becoming like a tree, sending roots. I found that to be very effective. I really appreciate that. I, you know, I agree. And I, I do some of that myself. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Mira. Okay, great. And Shilpa, I'm asking you to unmute. Great. Hi. So hi, there, Shilpa. hi. So um, you know, the, what you were talking about today reminded me too of an experience where I was watching a show once and um and they were really they were showing that a child had died and they showed the whole experience of what the family went through after their child had died. Wow. And while watching this show, it was so moving that you really felt, you know, that same fear coming through you. And, um, and then suddenly, you know, and I realized suddenly that, wait, my children are asleep and they're just fine. Hmm. You know, and that, the, that fear is the sister of gratitude the sibling mm. of gratitude. Yeah. And, um, and then the other thing that I thought of was that this practice that you're talking about is, um, is what Nassim Taleb talks about when he talks about anti-fragility. Mm. The idea that instead of breaking a bone when it's stressed, it actually becomes stronger. Yes. So that normally someone who's fragile, they say it's like a candle the wind blows, it blows out. Someone who's resilient has enough, has enough fuel that when the wind blows, they may diminish, but then they come back again. Whereas yeah. someone who's anti-fragile, the wind blows, they're like the burning bush where the wind blows and they become stronger. So I just, yeah. that's apparently what you were talking about today is all part of that practice of becoming anti-fragile. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I'll build on one thing you said here, Shilpa, which is Another thing I think that's helpful that I haven't um, named is where you just sort of get tired of being needlessly afraid. And to some extent, sometimes that is, you get tired of other people who are trying to make you worry about stuff. You've just kind of had it. You, no, I'm not going to worry that much about it. I, you're going to worry about it in your life. You live, you do you, I'll do me. You know, kind of like that. And or people who are not out of good intention, like the case I'm naming right there, but maybe out of bad intentions, they try to intimidate you or alarm you or suppress you, including in subtle ways by making you afraid, uh, and maybe scaled up for political purposes, uh, banging on forever about the evil other who is coming to get you. No. So the, the, you, it's kind of useful actually to drop into a sense of, I'm sick and tired of being afraid. And uh, I've had it, so that can be really quite helpful. I want to speak to a couple of um, questions that have come in. I don't know, Jack, if I'm going to be able to get to you. I just want to let you know that. It's not personal. Okay. So two questions I want to speak to. The first is, where am I here? From social anxiety. Somebody asked me about social anxiety. This is a particular kind of anxiety where it's like we're nervous around other people, maybe nervous of public speaking, we're afraid of rejection, 
or we just feel sort of shy. It's important to be really clear. A person can feel sort of shy without actually feeling anxious. Uh, that would be true for me in many ways. And you're just kind of internal. You're okay. You're all right. Um, you're not particularly anxious, but you're kind of shy. All right, what to do about it? I find two things that are really helpful. One is to recognize goodwill when it's there. Recognize that other people, maybe they don't know you, but they're willing to get to know you, or they don't have anything particularly against you yet. <laughs> yet. <laughs> you know, it's okay. There's sort, of, there's sort of an invitation. It's okay to, uh, to, to move into the situation. And you can recognize signs of friendliness, you know, coming toward you and see that. I think that's really quite useful. Um, a second thing that can really help is to get out of your own self-preoccupations, which often are very involved with social anxiety. Uh, we, we get preoccupied with ourselves. To release that and bring, move your attention out into them with compassion. Not being patronizing or condescending, but the compassion that can recognize what's there for them or what would be helpful for them. And be there to be helpful. That's a wonderful way to release preoccupations of anxiety, including be there with what a teacher of mine a long, long time ago described as a blessing disposition. Just a disposition to find what is likable in others, to, to find what can be appreciated, obviously while clear seeing what is not so great maybe, but finding what there is to appreciate, what is working, what is all right right now in them, and to just have that orientation and to, to be a being who maybe doesn't say too much, but who sort of radiates a general quality of um, what Carl Rogers called unconditional positive regard, a kind of uh, friendliness, a simple friendliness and interest in others. It's often really disarming for others to be in the presence of someone who is um, in a simple way, warm and interested, just that. And you could take refuge in your in authentic warmth and interest, which is your best odd strategy because it takes you off the hook. You have a lot less to do now. You don't have to be entertaining. You don't have to be right. You don't have to be charismatic. You just have to be warm and interested. <laughs> and that's such also a novel experience for many people to be around someone who's genuinely warm and interested and not trying to sell them something or manipulate them in any way or get anything, that they naturally warm up to you and naturally interested in you. That's my second suggestion. And then third about social anxiety, it's to, um, to realize at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's not about you. They're going to do what they do. Your job is to be you, virtuously, compassionately, warmly, interestedly, Etc. And some people will gravitate to you and some people won't. And if they won't, that's their right. You reserve that right to yourself, of course, so they have that right as well. And you know, to an extent, you got to be careful with this attitude, but it's their loss, right? Because you're pretty cool. All right. So social anxiety. Then last, helping others in the moment this is from Karen Herzog, uh, who, like with those who are in the moment of irrational fears, panic attacks. There's a whole complexity about this. Are you in a therapeutic relationship with them? You know, are they coming into the ER and you're doing the intake? I mean, that's a whole set of questions when you're in that relationship. But let's suppose it's a friend or a mate. Um, and I'll leave out being a child because that's another different a particular kind of relationship. I, th I think one of the very first things to do with people is not to be intrusive. It's to be yourself kind of stable and present, interested in hearing them and not jump. Don't jump unless there's an immediately emergency, you've got to do it. But otherwise, try not to jump to trying to talk them out of their experience. Try to understand that first thing I said, accept anxiety. What are you feeling? What's going on? Why are you feeling that? What are you concerned about? You know, maybe their concerns are incredibly legitimate and a bunch of other people have been patronizing or dismissive or punishing about their concerns. And it's really time to listen to them, what they're alarmed about. Um, so, you know, giving people that, I think it's very important. And that, that sense of being with them 
not being overwhelmed by them. You don't need them to stop because they're just too much for you. You're there. You're staying in place, rooted like a tree, as Mira said. Well, that can be very reassuring to someone who's freaking out, right? So that's the first step. And then I think it's helpful to second, and these two steps can overlap, to communicate simple reassuring facts. Like, well, you're you're safe right now, or you know, the bleeding is stopping, or we're calling 911. Um, I will drive you to the hospital. Um, you're still breathing. I'm with you. Uh, you. You know, whatever is factually true that can help people to not have exaggerated fears. Really important. And then I think it's important um, if someone's in the middle of a panic attack to remind them that no one has ever died of a panic attack, basically. Um, there are cases where people can terrify themselves into a heart attack, but it's pretty, pretty rare. And all panic attacks end, usually within 20 minutes. That's amazingly reassuring. It's horrible right now. You feel like you're dying. It's terrible. I've had one panic attack in my life. It was terrible. Um, yes, but they'll end. They end. And you're fundamentally okay. So that kind of reassurance can come in. And then moving into a plan of action. Wow, what are we going to do? What would be helpful here? Um, so I think those kind of three things, listening, stable presence yourself first, accurate information that's reassuring, particularly to decrease alarmist, exaggerated fears, and then third, moving into some kind of coping response. What are we going to do about this? How can I help you? That follows um, the other person and respects their wishes. Okay, well, let's take a breath. Ah. Hello, fear. Goodbye, fear. <laughs> you may be staying here, but I'm moving on. You might want to say it inside your own mind. Hello, fear. So long, fear. Fare you well. Fare you well. I'm living in clarity. I'm living in courage. I'm living in confidence.